think I'm yeah. going to go with the double lock almost uh, yeah, not exactly. Well, I think they're going to try to make it. A, if it's not, if it's know, almost, good then good it. luck. Well, but here, okay. That's what he plans on doing. Here's, he, um, the, the, the lots on Keener uh, undersized, so they may have to get a variance before we can petition. Sure, yeah, well, they yeah, want to. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start. They want to put a driveway in front. Did he walk by the house? It has massive yeah. pine trees. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everybody. Hi, this is uh, the um, um, meeting of the Trees and Green Infrastructure Committee for the city of Rehoboth Beach. We meet um, um, each month uh, at this time in the, the fr first Friday of the month or whatever. And, and, and uh, today we have, uh, we're departing from our usual routine. We've, we've brought a, uh, a lecturer, uh, Mr. Bill McAvoy, um, from uh, the de um, Department of Nat Natural Resources for the State of Delaware. And um, he's going to give a talk today about sedges, which is, I don't think is hi high on everybody's priority, but, but uh, uh, so, so I hope it will be very informative and uh, enlightening. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more about it. First, um, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously opening the meeting. I just have a couple uh, short um, housekeeping a task to to take care of it. One is roll call, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just give her attendance. Um, um, Mr. Van Horn, present. There you go. Uh, um, Miss Gay here. Miss Duncan here. Miss Jones here. We're all here. Uh, we're we're a, 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 a group of seven, and uh, some of our folks can't could make it today. But anyway, we have a quorum, and we're you know, prepared to do business here. Um, the, the, um, I'm, I'm going to start the meeting, well, I started the meeting about uh, 10 3, and, and, and we're just going to go into uh, Mr. McAvoy's talk. I also want to make mention that uh, a, 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 an individual came with some materials here from Master Gardeners, and um, you're more than welcome to take those, you know, later at the end of the meeting, whatever. Um, and I appreciate those being provided. Okay, and we have another another member joining us. Okay, hold on for a second. Um, um, yeah, I'm going to do that too. Now, now, we have one more one more uh, member here. Um, Katie Downs is present. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, with. I, I, well, I'm going to. I am going to um, request that I get a motion to re approve the minutes from our last meeting on February 9th. Uh, so moved. Uh, second. Second. Okay. Okay. All in favor to approve? Say aye. 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 Seems like it's approved to me. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, McAvoy if he wants to begin his presentation. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Do I, do I need this mic? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. yeah. Because yeah. I'll need probably, it for the video. <laughs> probably shade away from it. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I am, uh, I'm, I'm the botanist for the Delaware Department of Natural Resources, Division of Fish and Wildlife. I've been on the job for over 30 years. I've been studying the flora um, intently for, for that amount of time, uh, not just Delaware, but Delmarva Peninsula and actually the coastal plain of, of Eastern North America I've been studying the flora of. And um, I've been invited today to tell you all about the wonderful world of sedges, the sedge family of Delaware, the Cyperaceae. Cyperaceae is the botanical uh, name for the sedge family. And uh, I'm going to probably give you more information about sedges that you need or would ever want to have. So, so buckle up and here we go. Um, let's see, I need to put that on. There we go. Okay, so the sedge family here in Delaware is, where, is our focus, of course. And let's begin by answering or asking the botanical questions: What makes a sedge a sedge, and how do you, how do you distinguish sedges from grasses and rushes, 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 which are closely related to sedges and are often confused with sedges? So, 
Sedges are herbaceous plants, and they are either annual or they're perennial. A majority of them are perennial. So all perennial sedges have rhizomes. Some species have short rhizomes, and they form clumps or little tussocks, and they're classified as cespitose. Some species of sedges have elongated rhizomes, and they form these dense, wide-spreading stands or populations. They're classified as rhizomatous. Some species of sedges have their foliage that originate from the base of the plant, and they're called basal. They're low-growing plants with, with short um, stems and spikes. Some species of sedges are taller and more branched, and they have leaves arranged along the, the stem or the culm, and they're classified as calling. Now, <clears throat> I point these, these, these features out, um, one, you know, to help you um, distinguish sedges from other species, other groups of plants, but it's also important <coughs> to know these because it'll help you to identify, select species to use in your landscape or in your garden or in a restoration site. You know, do I want a species that stays put, is low growing, cespitose, or do I want a species that is tall and branched and leafy, a rhizominous that spreads out widely? Do I want a low growing plant with short stems or I want a tall growing plant with, with uh, uh, that's, that's branched, calling. So important points to, to keep in mind. Now the most distinguishing features of sedges are their reproductive parts, or their, their inflorescences, or their spikes. And these distinctive features separate them from grasses and rushes. And I'll use the, the, the genus Carex to describe these these reproductive parts. So all sedges, uh, the reproductive parts, inflorescence and spikes of all sedges are found at the terminal end of their stems or culms, and they all have a male, uh, male spike, male flowers, that's the staminate spike. All sedges have female flowers, the pistillate spikes. And these, each of these spikes are collectively made up of individual spikelets. And these spikelets are just one flowered. And sedges, they have a very diverse, or can have a very diverse arrangement of these reproductive spikes. Uh, for example, Carex baradii. You, you can find the male staminate spike attached to the tip of the pistillate female spike. Or in the case of Carex squarosa, you find the staminate male spike at the base of the female pistillate spike. Now I mentioned these, these spikelets are one flowered, and these the female flowers are enclosed within a bottle-shaped structure called a perigenium. And often the perigenium is extended into a beak. And at the tip of the beak, are, you often find two teeth. And from the opening of that beak, you find the stigmas, which is the reproductive part of the flower that collects the pollen. And those stigmas can either be two or three. The stigma is connected to the, the ovary by a style. And the ovary, when fertilized, develops into a dry seed or an akene. And these perigenia, the shape and size of these perigenia, are very, very important diagnostic features of a sedge, as well as the, the seed, the akene, very important diagnostic features that you need to, you, you, you need these to help you to identify uh, different species. And without them, you're, you're, you're probably stuck. You probably will never get the species level. Now, as I mentioned, um, 
sedges are very closely related to grasses and rushes. Um, a lot of times folks confuse them. Rushes are more closely related to sedges than grasses are in an evolutionary sense. But all sedges, the stems of all sedges, they, are, they can either be round or they can be triangular. And when they're triangular, they have edges. And you've probably heard the term sedges have edges. Well, not all sedges have edges, so that doesn't always work. They can either be round or they can be triangular. Uh, the stems are, are solid compared to grasses, which are hollow. And the stems of sedges do not have nodes. Nodes are these swollen areas on the stems where branches and leaves originate. You find those on grasses, not on sedges. Now, rushes, the stems of rushes, are also round but never triangular. They're solid, like sedges, and they also don't have nodes on their stems. So how do you distinguish a rush from a sedge? Well, as I mentioned, sedge flowers are only one, one or the spikelets are only one flowered. But rushes, the spikelets are many flowered and produce many seed. Also, rushes usually have no to very few leaves on their stem. Most of their leaves come from the base of the plant. And I'll point out that the, uh, the rushes here in Delaware are represented by the genera Juncus and Lugula. Now, the sedge family is huge worldwide. I mean, thousands of taxa, species, subspecies, and varieties hundreds of genera. And when you're dealing with a, a family that large, it's helpful to group the different taxa, uh, organize the different taxa into groups or sections. And those sections are based on uh, morphological similarities between the species. So species that are similar in appearance, similar morphologically, are are all organized into a particular section. For example, section Lupulini. Uh, here in Delaware, this section is represented by Carex lupuliformis, Lupulina gigante, and not pictured, Intumescens and Louisianica. But you can see by looking at these, these spikes, these fertile spikes, pistillate female spikes, they're all very, very similar in appearance. And here's a close-up of those spikes. Um, you see really only the major differences are the length and width of the spikes and the, the arrangement, subtle arrangements of the, the perigenia. Um, another thing to keep in mind that will help you to select species for your, your gardens and landscapes. Sec, for example, section lupulini, they're all wetland species. If you want wetland species, you know, take a look at section lupulina. They're all cespitose, clump forming. They're all calling, tall and branched and leafy. All right, as I mentioned, the sedge family is huge. Worldwide, uh, you've got 100 genera. Here in North America, there's 27 genera. Here in Delaware, there are 16 genera. Taxa, species, subspecies, and variety over uh, about 5,000 worldwide, 843 here in North America, and 248 taxa here in Delaware. So it's a, it's a, big, it's a big family. Summarizing the sedge family here in Delaware, as I mentioned, 16 genera, 248 taxa. Of the 248, 228 are native. 20 are non-native or non-indigenous. Non-native are those species that are not native to North America. You know, they usually come from Asia, Europe. Non-indigenous taxa, they're native to North America, but they're not native to Delaware. Uh, they're usually recent arrivals here in Delaware. They're either in intentionally introduced or they're here due to the, the breakdown uh, to natural barriers to dispersal. Of those 20 that are non-native, non-indigenous, four are invasive, invasive species that outcompete and displace 
our native sedges and other native vegetation. The majority of our sedges here in Delaware are wetland species grown poorly drained soils. 71% is a lot of them compared to 29% that are upland species growing moist or very well drained sandy soils. Just comparing the sedge family to other large family here in Delaware, the grass family is the biggest family in Delaware, 277 taxa, followed by the aster family, 256, and then the sedge family, 248. It's a lot of species to, to deal with, and I know every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> After 33 years, you get to know them all. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the rare sedges we have here in Delaware. Nearly 50% of all our native sedges in Delaware are rare. Uh, 100 taxa are rare here in the state. Of that number, 25 are historical or extirpated. Historical meaning they have been not been seen or reported anywhere in Delaware for 20 or more years. Extirpated mean they're gone never to be seen in Delaware again. I'll point out that species rarity uh, is a result of the destruction and degradation of habitat. That's, that's the number one cause of species rarity. Non-native invasive species are also a, a real threat to native vegetation, uh, as well as overbrowsing by deer, also a huge threat to our native plants. Here in Delaware, we have nine taxa that are globally rare or uncommon, rare, uncommon throughout the world. We have one species that is federally listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as endangered. We have 20 that are rare in the North Atlantic region. That's Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and then everything north into Canada is the North Atlantic region. And we have two endemic taxa. Endemic taxa are those species that are only found within a defined geographic area, you know, like a state or a county or even a habitat type. And we have, we have two of those species. They, they're found growing nowhere else in the world except within that defined geographic area. I'll talk about those two. Sedges grow in a wide variety of habitat types upland forests and woodlands, native grasslands or prairies. We do have them in Delaware, but they're very rare. Salt and brackish tidal marshes, you can find sedges. A lot of salt and brackish tidal marshes down in this area, particularly in the Inland Bay region. And freshwater tidal marshes, you find sedges. However, Freshwater tidal marshes, uh, not only here in Delaware, but throughout, throughout um, eastern U.S., if not beyond, are disappearing due to, to climate change, global warming, sea level rise, and saltwater intrusion. These uh, freshwater tidal marshes, the species in these freshwater tidal marshes, cannot tolerate higher le high levels of salinity. And all our freshwater species are disappearing due to sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. In time, they're all going to become brackish and salt marshes. Forested wetlands. Delaware has thousands of acres of forested wetlands. And forested wetlands are probably the most diverse, well, <coughs> the most diverse uh, assemblage of sedges are probably found in these forested wetlands. As I mentioned earlier, um, the majority of our wet, uh, sedges here in Delaware are wetland species, so it's no surprise that you would find a, a diverse array of them in these forests of wetlands. A forest of, uh, wetland type is an Atlantic white cedar swamp. It's a, a rare uh, forest of wetland type, only found in Sussex County, dominated by Atlantic white cedar Camisiferous tioides. And you can find a lot of really rare sedges growing in Atlantic white cedar swamps, as well as many, many other rare plants, orchids, carnivorous plants, for example. Find sedges on the floodplains of rivers, creeks, and streams of broad, flat areas that where 
floodwaters collect during storm events. And you find sedges in these seasonally flooded wetland depressions, also known as uh, Delmarva Bays. <clears throat> and these are, these are depression areas that you find within forested areas. And they're seasonally flooded. They're flooded in the, uh, the winter and spring when the groundwater table is high. And then when the groundwater table is low in late summer, early fall, the ponds are dry. And after they draw down, you just get this really high productivity of vegetative growth, which includes many, many species of sedges and many rare species of sedges. Groundwater seepage wetlands, you know, areas where the groundwater seeps to the surface and creates kind of like a little wet meadow. Atlantic coastal dunes, right down here you find lots of sedges growing on the dunes. And then in the back dunes, you find these little depression wetlands where a really diverse assemblage of, of sedges will, will grow. So let's discuss the 16 genera that, that Delaware has here within the sedge family. And I've, I've arranged these slides phylogenetically, which is a way to show the evolutionary history and relationships between groups of organisms, and in this case, sedges. And we'll start out with the genus Scirpus, represented by seven taxa here in Delaware. And this is Scirpus atrovirens, the black rush. This is uh, Cespitos. Grows tall, about four to five feet tall. Grows in wetlands. Uh, it's calling, very leafy and branched. Um, you see the, the reproductive spikes, inflorescences here. Really attractive sedge, I think. And our next genus is Eriophorum, represented by two taxa. This is an image of Eriophorum virginicum, the tawny cotton grass sedge. And this is a rare sedge, grows in wetlands, very peaty acidic wetlands. The other species in this genus is Eriophorum gracili, which is extirpated in Delaware. Last time it was seen in the state was in the 1890s. So this is an image of Eriophorum virginica in flower. You can see the, the stamens here. Here it is with <laughs> mature seeds, mature akenes. It looks like a cotton ball. And this cotton-like substance are filaments that are attached to the seed. And they help to disperse the seed a distance away from the parent plant. But when it's in, when it's in you know, mature fruit, it's, it's a really interesting looking plant. <clears throat> Our next genus is Trichophorum. Only one species of Trichophorum here in Delaware, and that's Planifolium, the bashful bulrush, another rare species. Uh, and this species only, is only grows up in the uh, Piedmont of northern Newcastle County, Delaware, not down here on the coastal plain. Grows on very dry, thin, nutrient-poor soils, steep slopes. Cespitose forms these little clumps, really attractive spikes. Next genus is Furina. Two taxa here in Delaware in that genus. This was Furina squarosa, hairy umbrella sedge. Uh, this species is a, a perennial. The other Furina, Furina pumila, is an annual. Um, uncommon, but you can find it growing around, but a wetland species. Our next genus is Bulboschinus. Three tax here in Delaware this is Fluviatilis, and this is a species that only grows in the freshwater tidal marshes. As I mentioned, those marshes are disappearing due to sea level rise, saltwater intrusion. In time, 
this common sedge will probably disappear because it cannot tolerate even the slightest levels of salinity. Next genus is Chinoplectus. This is Tabernay montani, the soft stem bulrush, represented by five taxa. Um, I know this is a species that is offered commercially. Uh, works very well in, um, you know, backyard garden ponds, uh, or on the, you know edges of ponds, wetland species. The stem, you know, it can be three, four feet tall. Um, the stem is, has no leaves on it, only at the base, and just the inflorescence here that comes out the terminal end of the, of the, of the stem. Very attractive sedge. Our next genus is Chinoplectuella, and represented by five taxa here in Delaware, and I've I've chosen this particular species to show you because it is a, a non-native invasive species, Chinoplectiella mucronata, highly, highly aggressive, highly invasive. It's a wetland species. You typically find it growing in stormwater retention ponds, ditches, farm ponds, shallow water. Um, and I guarantee you, uh, that in this area, with all the new development that's going in, all the new subdivisions, you know, they all have to have stormwater retention ponds. I guarantee if they don't already have this, in time they will, and this will completely dominate your stormwater pond. Uh, you know, those stormwater ponds, they do have value. Uh, well, one thing they, you know, the reason they put them is is to help to, you know, capture the stormwater and runoff and then to filter. Uh, the pollutants that may be in that runoff. But um, native vegetation grows in these stormwater ponds, and that, that's valuable to wildlife. But this, this species will completely outcompete all the native vegetation. Notice here at the base of the, the spike that the stem is at a right angle. It's bent at a right angle. Actually, that's called an involucra actually really not part of the stem. Uh, that's how you can distinguish this particular species, the Chinoplectiella, from our native Chinoplectiella. This is a native Chinoplectiella, Persiana. You see how the, the end of the stem is erect. So if you're, if you're out walking around stormwater ponds um, and you see, you see this plant with this crazy bent stem, you've got Mucronata. Since we are talking about non-native invasive species, I might as well mention this one, Carex cobamugai. It's the Asiatic sand sedge. This is the this inset here is of its um, fertile spikes. Non-native invasive species from Asia, obviously. And uh, this this species was introduced to and it was to, to plant on dunes to stabilize dunes. It certainly will do that, but it will outcompete all other native vegetation. It's perennial rhizominous, as you can see here. This is all Carex cobamugai. And it, it is now established in all our state parks up and down the coast, from Cape Penlope and down to Fenwick Island. And staff from the Division of Parks and Recreation, they put a tremendous amount of time effort and resources into controlling this species every year. Um, every year they find new, new populations. Matter of fact, this population we found this spring uh, at the point at Cape Henlopen Open State Park. And it was probably the biggest stand I've ever seen of it. Um, just terribly, terribly invasive. I'm gonna, <coughs> I'm gonna, continue to talk a little bit about invasive species here. Beach, uh, beach vitex, vitex rotundifolia. This is not a sedge, of course. This is a shrub in the mint family, Lamiaceae. Highly, highly invasive. It was also introduced to stabilize dunes. 
here on the uh, on this side of the fence, you can see how it dominates. And then it's creeping towards this foredune. This is all native vegetation here. In time, this will completely outcompete and displace all the native vegetation. If you want to stabilize your dunes, use native vegetation that have evolved and adapted to this type of environment. Native vegetation will stabilize the dunes just as well, if not better, than non-native non -native species. So please, if you, if you live on the beach, you want to stabilize your dune, plant native vegetation. And this is also another species that is now showing up in all the state parks. And they're going to they're gonna have to put a lot of time into controlling this one as well. So how do you get rid of them? I mean, you know, <laughs> well, it usually, they usually use herbicide to kill it. That's the most effective, um, efficient way to do it. Yeah, a lot of chemical. It sure is, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, that's enough about invasive species. Our next gene is Iliacris. It's a large genus here in Delaware, 44 taxa. This is Iliacris obtusa. This is an annual, um, cespitos annual. If you've got a wet spot in your yard that you can't get anything to grow, get some seed of this. And I know this is available commercially. Get some seed, just throw it down. This will high rate of germination. It'll fill the spot in and just keep seeding itself in. This is, all, this is another Eliochris, but this one's a perennial, very interesting plant. And this grows in the, the tidal salt marshes in the inland bays and around Lewis and Rehoboth. Wolf Neck, Holland Glade, that area. Um, <coughs> you can see these, these long arching stems. So what it does, you've got a plant rooted in the ground. It'll send up this long stem. It'll arch down. The tip of the stem will hit the soil, and then it'll root right there. And another plant will develop, and then it'll do the same thing. It just kind of walks, walks through the marsh. Uh, and just you know, creating this large rhizominous population. Our next genus is <coughs> Fimbristolis, represented by five taxa here in Delaware. <coughs> and this is Fimbristolis propusula, very rare sedge in Delaware. And this species grows in the seasonally flooded wetland depressions, the Carolina bays. I pointed out earlier. It's the only place it grows. It's an annual sedge. And when the ponds are dry in late summer, early fall, the seeds germinate. And has a very narrow window before that pond fills up with water again. It has a very narrow window to complete its life cycle. Sometimes it's a couple weeks. So it germinates quickly, uh, grows very fast. Matures seed, drops its seed, seeds overwinters at the bottom of the pond, even when it's flooded. And when the pond draws down again, seeds germinate, just repeats the cycle. Uh, the species is entirely dependent on this habitat type, fluctuating groundwater levels. Doesn't grow anywhere else. Another Fimbristolis Caroliniana. I show this one because it's really common in the ditches along Route 1 when you drive from Dewey Beach down to Fen Fenwick Island. It's really common in the, in the roadside ditches along 1. <clears throat> Next genus is Bulbo stylus, represented of only one taxon here in Delaware. This is Capillaris. It's an annual. It grows on bare sand. Get some seed of this, throw it down on some bare sand, and guaranteed to germinate and grow for you. Cypress, next genus, 32 tax, another very large genus here in Delaware. This is Lancastriensis. Um, the Cypress are very attractive sedges. This particular one is about two, three feet tall, growing sandy, moist soils, very leafy, cespitose, colleen, 
attractive spikes with these reflexed spike lats. And Delicium arundinaceum, our next genus. This genus is monotypic, meaning it's represented by only one species, any, you know, just one species. Uh, it's found within the genus Delicium, and that's arundinaceum. <coughs> Common sedge, wetland sedge, rhizomatous, very leafy. You can see the spikes here in the axles of the, of the leaves. Rhinchospora, our next genus, another large genus here in Delaware, 23 taxa. And the seeds, you, know, you can see the common name is horned beak sedge. And the, the achenes, here at the tip of the achene, you see this long appendage here, like a horn or a beak. Rhinchospora, the genus name, rinko, means horned or beak, or, or beak, and spora means seed, so uh, beaked or horned seed. This particular species, macrostachy, can grow very tall, four or five, six feet tall, leafy, wetland species. And um, notice the, uh, the the spikes here. Each individual spike led is is surrounded by a, a scale. It's a brown scale. Most of the rink osprey have these brown scales. But there's one species where the scales are white. Rink osprey alba, very attractive sedge. Um, grown in mass here, it, it's really attractive. Here's another rink osprey. I'll show you this one because this is one of the endemic species, one of the two endemic species that Delaware has. Actually endemic to the Delmarva Peninsula. Only known from Sussex County, Worcester County, Maryland, Wicomico Mar County, Maryland, and Dorchester County, Maryland. Nowhere else in the whole world does this species grow. Rhinchospora mesoatlantica, and it only grows in those seasonally flooded depressions, the Delmarva Bays. And this species was actually, just a few months ago, uh, formally, officially recognized as a species new to science. Uh, prior to that, we, uh, we, 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 actually, we called it something else um, that I won't get into. It's a long story, actually. But, uh, but we always knew that this was different, uh, that the name we did call it just didn't fit. It was different. Um, but um, we just we just couldn't uh, we, you know we couldn't key it out we couldn't properly identify it but it was just recently studied by taxonomists and and uh, determined to be new to science. Next genus is Caladium Caladium mariscoides. Just this is the only species we have here in Delaware. So rhizominous sedge grows in wetlands. The, I showed you an image of the, uh, the inner dune depression wetlands, you know, those little wetlands in the back dunes. This is where this, this species will grow. Really attractive, I think. I think all sedges are attractive. I, I love the family. That's <laughs> my favorite group of plants to study. Scleria trigomerata. This is uh, in the genus Scleria. And all this, the, the, the seeds, the akeen of the genus Scleria, they're white. They look like little golf balls or little eggs. Um, very, very unique to the, the sedge family. And our final, final genus is Carex, which I touched on earlier, talking about reproductive parts. And this is, um, this is the other endemic species. Carex titanica variety cambii. Well, actually, the, the genus Carex is huge in Delaware, 132 tax. It's the largest genus in the state of any family of plants. <clears throat> now, this particular species, it grows in groundwater seepage wetlands. I mentioned that earlier. This is endemic to northern Newcastle County, Delaware. Uh, one population. One population in eastern Cecil County, Maryland, and I think three populations in southeastern Pennsylvania. I think Chester County and 
uh, Delaware County, I believe, in the two counties. So extremely rare plant, globally rare. Um, and this is under also under taxonomic review. It'll probably be des described as a uh, a full species. Right now, it's listed, uh, recognizes a, a variety of Carex titanica, variety Cambii. But once it's um, the study is done, it'll probably, I, at least I hope, that it'll be named Carex cambii. And cambii, that, that species named cambii is for William Camby. William Camby was a botanist from, from Delaware, he, from Wilmington, Delaware. And he was the first person to discover this plant, so that the variety was named for him. But again, I, it's most likely a, a distinct full species, and hopefully it will be named Carex cambii. Now, you're probably all familiar with a, a trial that Mount Cuba, the Mount Cuba study, Center did a couple years ago on Carex, and they, they published this research report on their findings. Uh, you can get this report. If you haven't seen it, you can get this report online. And they trialed a number of different species of Carex, um, just looking for, you know, horticultural value. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through a few of those species that ranked high in their research. One being Carex bromoides, the brome-like sedge. It occurs here in Delaware. And this is how it grows in the wild. It's a wetland species. It's cespitose, forms these clumps. This inset is of its fertile spike. Um, of course, you know, Mount Cuba, they're, uh, they're amazing up there. They can get these, they can get wetland species to grow in upland soils or um, upland species to grow in wetland soils. I don't know how they do it, but. Um, so um, despite its wetland classification, you could probably grow this in moist, shady soils. In, in the wild, it grows in forested wetlands, in shade. Another species that ranked high was Carex stricta, the tussock sedge. A uh, beautiful, beautiful sedge. Form, you know, mature plants can form these giant tussocks. It's cespitose. Very, very beautiful when it's in flower in the spring. Another wetland plant that they, they seem to be able to grow in moist upland soils. But here it is in the wild. Now this, this species is, is a very valuable species to this little guy, the, the bog turtle, the endangered bog turtle. And the bog turtle only lives in wetlands where the tussock sedge grows because it lays its eggs here at the down, nestled down in here in the, in the base of the tussock. It'll only grow it at its, it lay its eggs on the tussock sedge, nowhere else. So um, if there's no tussock sedge, there's no bog turtle. Here's another one that ranked high, Carex jamesii. Now this is an upland species, grows in moist soils. Um, cespitose forms these nice little clumps. But also a very, very rare plant in Delaware. It's only known from one small population up in northern Newcastle County. Carex Pennsylvanica, Pensil Pennsylvania sedge, also ranked very high. Now this is rhizomatous. It forms these broad patches. Um, and uh, they find this you know, to be a good alternative to lawns, this species. Um, it, here it is growing in the wild. You can see it doesn't grow really dense, at least in the wild. I mean, if you grew it in your garden, you know, good rich soils, it would probably be a little more, more dense. But um, I find that if you plant within these stands of Caris Pennsylvanica, you know, like wildflowers, particularly I like um, the blue-eyed grass, Cicerinque magustifolium, uh, just really nice contrast when you plant that within the Pennsylvania sedge. Here it is in flower, <clears throat> early spring. 
And here's an image of someone who has, is using it as a lawn. Looks like a, a steep slope that it's, that where it's growing, probably a spot that's not real easily mowed. And one great thing about these sedges, if you use it as a lawn alternative, they only grow so high. So you don't have to mow it very often. You know, your fescues and your poas, you know, they keep growing. Now, this is their number one, number one sedge that they, they trialed. It came out higher than any other sedge. This is Carrick's woody eye, wood sedge. Now, this is not native to Delaware. Uh, it's more Midwestern distribution. And in the east, you only find it in the mountains. So it's not native to Delaware. Um, but this is how it grows in the wild. Forms these clumps, cespitose. Here it is in flower. But Mount Cuba found this to be a great lawn alternative. Um, here on the, uh, on the right side of the mower, is it, uh, before it has been mowed, and of course you can see the area where that has been mowed, and the more you mow it, the denser it gets. So probably the best uh, lawn alternative that you can find. Now, there are several sedges that they did not trial that I think would be very good in a landscape that I'm familiar with in the wild, such as Carex radiata, eastern star sedge. You can see these spikes kind of look star-shaped. Cespitose clump-forming sedge grows in moist, um, moist uh, sandy soils probably be good down here. And a very, very close relative is Carex rosea, the rosy sedge. Now, Carex rosea and Carex radiata are in the same section, Stellulati. You can see the, the similar, similarities between the two species. This is a great plant. As you can see, I mean, the, the picture speaks for itself. You know, you, you plant this on mass and do you have a question? Um, not very high. Uh, you can grow it foot. like grass. You probably could, yeah. A foot at most. In the wild, that is. <laughs> you know, everything seems to grow a little differently in the garden. In you know, the you, front yard. Yeah, like no competition, good soils, you know. Now, there's, here's a section. Carex tonsa is in section acrocystis. As a matter of fact, Carex pennsylvanica is in section acrocystis. And these are the sedges that bloom the earliest in the spring. They'll start blooming probably in a week or so. You know, late March, very early April, they start to flower sooner than any other sedge. And they green up very quickly in the early spring. Matter of fact, they stay somewhat green throughout the winter. Uh, these are upland species, the entire section. They grow in dry, sandy soils. So down here, it would be great. They're all cespitose. They form nice little clumps. Here's another one in the same section, Carex amunzii. This stuff will, or these, most of these acrocystis will grow just about uh, in anywhere. Well, any dry, sandy soil, it'll grow, shade or sun. Another acrocystis, Carex nigra marginata. Um, common name, black edge sedge. Here's a close-up of their spikes. And uh, nigro marginata, you see the, the black coloration on the margin of the scale. Nigro, black, marginata, margin. This Carex lurida is not in Carex ac ac uh, section acrocyst. This is a different section, but this is a great sedge. This is a sedge will grow anywhere. It's, it's primarily a wetland species, but it'll grow in upland, moist upland soil. As a matter of fact, I, I've seen it growing in clay soils that turn to concrete in the summer, and it's still growing very well. Really attractive uh, inflorescent spikes. Um, forms these big tussocks. Really nice, uh, nice sedge, easily grown.
and I, 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 I believe I've seen a seed for this for sale commercially. You just get a packet and throw it in a spot, and it most likely will germinate for you. It grows in a lot of different places. If you've got a house on the beach, plant Carex silicea. This is a species that only grows on the dunes, nowhere else, but on the dunes. It thrives there. It can compete well there. Massive amounts of spikes. It's a cespitose sedge, perennial. Carex intumescens, I mentioned section lupulini earlier. Gigantia, lupiformis, lupulina. This is also in the same section. Really attractive sedge. Moist, shady soils. Cespitose perennial, colleen, leafy branched. This is another great little sedge. Upland sedge grows in uh, moist, shady soils. Carex glaucodia, the blue sedge. Foliage is a beautiful blue green, stays green throughout the season, or throughout the year, I should say. Uh, this is it growing in the wild. Here it is growing in your garden, you know, in, in rich soils without much competition. You know, it's more robust. And finally, something that's not a Carex, uh, Scirpus pendulus, really attractive sedge. Uh, you see those pendulous inflorescences that hide down. It's a perennial. It uh, gets about three, four feet tall. Plantils and mass, and it's just really attractive. And with that, I will conclude um, this link here. If you're not familiar with the floor of Delaware, you can, you can go, uh, go to this address. And the entire floor of Delaware you can find here, not just sedges, but the entire flora, um, all kinds of different information about the flora of Delaware you can find at this website. Any questions? Excuse me, can we have uh, people asking questions come to the microphone? Because we're, uh, we're recording this and like to have the questions, if that's okay. Did you got it? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I guess I have a question for the committee. Um, on my street, you know, there are the first 10 or 15 feet belongs to the city. And in our case, you know, we've planted right to that edge and then there was grass. So if we were to dig up the grass and plant sedges, what's the city going to do about it? I mean, you know, I mean, on the Hanlopen Avenue, I mean, the people on Hanlopen Avenue have certainly taken over the city right of way. There's plants and bushes and grass and all kinds of stuff in it. On my street, they really haven't done that. But if we want to take up the grass that's there and plant some of the hedges that he's talked about, or sedges, what, what can we do that? What will happen? It, uh, as, as you well know, that policy has shifted back and forth like the sands of time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, I, 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 we, don't have, we don't have any answer for that, but okay. I mean, it's something to pose. Well, we uh, looked at trees, but, but yeah, we decided right. that, w that we'd never have stand a chance. Yeah. So, um, but this seems like it's environmentally a good thing to do, blah, 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 and maybe, You're you right. know, m maybe uh, uh, that might. It, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer okay. other than it's like asking for forgiveness rather than, you know, right. it's really the, the, right. the key to this. Well, I don't thing. want to talk about yeah. things that do that, you know, the, like okay. the converted basements. Okay. And then my next question is, where do you get these plants? Where, if I wanted to buy sedges, you know, some of the sedges you've talked about, um, wh wh where do I go to buy them? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> there's a, not, a, not a lot that are offered commercially. There's a handful of species, like Pennsylvania. Um, I know is readily available. Most folks are, are selling. So, that. like in a nursery, you mean like oh, a Oh, sure, yeah, nursery or, or you can order first them aid online. or something. Uh, I do know that Prairie Moon Nursery, they offer a lot of uh, sedges, seeds of a lot of these sedges that several of them that I've, I've discussed. But that's today. not that's not here. That's like on, online or something. Yeah, that would be online. Oh. right? But, you know, uh, more and more and more, I'm seeing some of the nurseries uh, offering sedges now. Cause, okay. But 
right we just now, have to look around. The diversity around. of sedges that are offered commercially are, is not that great, unfortunately. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask a... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to you more. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Two questions. Number one, uh, how easy are these to transplant? And number two, once they're established, how much water do they need? Well, uh, they are easy to divide and transplant. Um, they're pretty, pretty hardy plants. I've never had any trouble moving my sedges around. Uh, and it depends, in regards to watering, it depends on the species. You know, if you're going to try to plant a wetland species. Sorry. I can just... <laughs> going to try to plant some of these wetland species uh, in an upland situation, it's probably going to need more water than normally. Sorry. Yeah, you, you may have to water some of these uh, species that are like poorly drained soils a bit more if you're going to grow it in an upland situation. The ones that you said were lawn alternatives. Yeah, like the Carex Pennsylvanica. It grows in dry sandal soils. Well, you never have to water it. Just wait for it to rain. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> just, just come up. Okay, so this is kind of a two-part question. Um, first of all, when you talk about sedges as a lawn alternative, can any of them take any kind of foot traffic? Because when you think about what pe people use lawns for, that's significant. Uh, the other one is, how does one establish a lawn of sedges? Can you seed them in like grasses? Do you have to plant plugs? And, and that kind of gets to where do you get these things in the first place? Yeah. Um, um, the, in, in planting them, it's usually plugs. You use plugs. Like the Carex Pennsylvanica, I know you can buy flats of that. Um, just get a lot of flats and, and, and put them in your lawn, and it actually spreads pretty quickly. Um, so you could certainly try seed, but you're going to have to prepare the, the ground for that, you know, give it an, uh, a bare soil to throw your seed onto. But I think, uh, I think the method is mostly used is to put in plugs. And again, it depends on the species, but the Pennsylvania goes pretty fast. And I'm not that familiar with Carex woodii because it's not native to Delaware. Uh, but I, I noticed at, at the Mount Cuba trials, you know, I went up there every once in a while to see what was going on because I actually had provided a lot of the plant material for them. And I would see this Carex woodii in the, in the bed, and it was, it was growing pretty fast. Um, so it's probably like Pennsylvania can grow pretty fast. Um, what was the first part of your question? I forgot. Oh, foot traffic. That's right. Yeah, they some species seem to be uh, pretty tolerant of being trampled, um, particularly those acrocystis. They're pretty tough. Uh, you know, like the, the Pennsylvanica and the Tonza and the Munzii. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that would be a real concern. Okay. I'm going to have uh, Katie. <laughs> how how would um, Carex laxicolmus be uh, being established as a sedge in uh, in a shade garden? Yeah, Carex laxicolmus um, here in Delaware. Um, in the wild, it grows in 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 wetlands. Okay. Um, so usually floodplains, uh, not not super wet, just usually moist ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would, in shade, uh, in in moist soils in your yard, it would probably do very well, actually. Okay. And would that be a sedge that you could mow, or um, probably not? No, it, it's a cespito sedge. It it's in the wild. It's it's. Um, it's not very leafy. Um, it has very attractive foliage, you know, the blue-green foliage, but but not much of it. Um, it doesn't spread much, so I don't think that would be a good alternative for lawns. Okay. You know, an attractive sedge for the garden certainly, right. but not for lawn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Um, I can vouch for um, Carex Pennsylvanica. I'm a contractor, and it is a great plant. Um, but my question was about the Carex Woodii. Was there, is it more sun loving, more shade loving? Uh, in the wild, it grows in shade. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, but um, I could, <laughs> Mount Q is growing in full sun and was huh. doing great. Yeah. But, you know, there are magicians up there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just come up. <laughs> if that's all right. I just wanted to share some potential um, information for the folks that are looking for sedges. I know that there's going to be <clears throat> a water family festival and native plant sale at the James Farm, and that's scheduled for Saturday, May fourth, from ten to four. I attended it last year, and I know there are vendors from all over the place that are bringing native plants for sale. So that's a possibility. You can look it up online. Um, Center for the Inland Bays and DENREC both have information online about the native plant sale on the 4th. Thank you for that. Okay. I just want to mention that this um, our, uh, talk is being uh, recorded, so you can go back and listen to it. It's not, a, not immediately, let's just use you within a week or so. Oh, no. Oh, it'll be it's later an, today. It's immediate or all with, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So you can you can access it from the uh, city website. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. Um, we have a small clump of carrick something or other, <laughs> five or six plants that we bought at East Coast. You know, at the end of the year sale, clumpy, ten inches or so. I don't want to mow it. It's very nice in the spot that it is. But is it something that periodically we should shear it? like liriope, like grasses, or just let it go? Because it does get a little ratty looking. I mean, it's been a great plant, but. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you, you probably could do that, and, and it wouldn't be harmful to the plant. Certainly, you know, late in the season after it's completed its, its life cycle. Um, I, 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 earlier in the presentation, I, I pointed out Carex lurida, the shall sallow sedge. It was a great plant, would grow anywhere. Um, forms these big, beautiful clumps during the growing season. However, at the end of the season, it does get kind of ratty. It, it all flops over, turns brown. At that point, is it would be a good time to shear it off. So but it, cover or something. Yeah, and it'll come back strong the next season. We have a, oh, we got one more. Here we go. Thanks, Bill. Um, Inland Bay's Garden Center is uh, actually specializing in native plants. Now, there's there's a lot of requests. I'm, I'm in the Delaware Master Naturalist Program. Uh, the biggest two things that we have on our agenda are probably dealing with invasives and getting more people to, to put native plants in their lawns or businesses or landscaping. But the more we request native species plants at our favorite nursery or landscaper, the more they will supply them. So it's all about supply and demand. It's a business, we understand that, but uh, Bill could probably speak to the difference between native species and cultivars, what, what the advantages are or disadvantages. Um, yeah, cultivars, I'm sure you probably all know, that it's usually, those are usually hybrids, selections, between uh, two uh, species, uh, two species in the same genus, um, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the propagator is looking for a particular trait that's uh, valuable, attractive to the, to the gardener. And um, also known as, you know, that, well, the, the species that it's, uh, the, the parents of that cultivar, you know, are, they're known as the straight species, and then the cultivar is, is um, you know, the, the, the combination of the two. Again, to uh, find a, a favorable trait that's that's good for the garden. Um, those species, um, there has been some research done on cultivars uh, about their value to wildlife, and for the most part. Uh, wildlife tend to avoid the fruit or flowers of cultivars. 
Um, you know, there are some species of wildlife that will nectar or eat the fruit, but uh, for the most part, they don't. They're more attracted to the straight species. So, you know, when you're when you're looking for native plants for the garden, that's one thing to keep in mind: uh, the straight species versus the cultivar. Well, I think I'm going to call it here. Okay. Uh, who learned something today? <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much Thank for coming. Thank you very well. Um, it, it's there's something about experts, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, th thank you all for coming today. This is probably the largest turnout we've, at least I've witnessed since I've been here. But I, but I think the idea of sharing this information to people, it, it may drop a seed of thought it might inspire you it might you know have you transform your uh, your your lawn and garden and everything so uh, and and uh, uh, I, I I appreciate uh, that uh, you know, obviously uh, Bill took the time to come down here to talk to us it's I appreciate the fact that we have a, uh, a de department of natural resources who has the human resources that can share their information with us and I, and I thank you very much I appreciate it um, we, we're kind of have a little bit of, I mean, I, I don't know if you got to get out of here right away or whatever. Some people may have some, you know, questions or whatever, if that's okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to adjourn. Yeah, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Uh, with, with any comments for about? No, uh, I don't think so. Well, no. next time. Okay. Well, we, we hope to have a meeting next month. Okay, but anyway, at uh, 11.10, I'm adjourning the meeting.